Welcome to the Political Trenches, local government at work, the podcast where Ian McCormack and I dive into the heart of the most significant municipal news spanning Canada from coast to coast to coast. In each episode, we dissect the decisions, explore the dynamic landscape of local governance. Today, we bring you the letter W, which stands for Welcome to Our Community. Later in the episode, we have tourism specialist for Tourism Oxford, Meredith Maywood. But first... Ian, happy February. Wyerton Willie has sawn his shadow, which only means a few more weeks of winter left. Are you as excited as I am? I don't think I could possibly be as excited as you are, but <clears throat> I am glad about it's 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 Groundhog Day, so we could maybe just play the same episode we played at this time last year and just be done with this whole thing. So we have a few stories that we want to dive into, and they're pretty heavy-duty stories. So first, we're going to be starting off in Manitoba, where a Winnipeg councillor is calling for metal detectors at the entrance to City Hall as part of beefing up security measures in response to a disturbing incident in Edmonton in January. Now, on January 23rd, a heavily armed man carrying guns and explosive fired shots and threw a Molotov cocktail inside Edmonton City Hall. No one was injured and a 28-year-old man faces charges of including reckless discharge of a firearm, using an explosive substance, arson, using a firearm while committing an offense and careless use of a firearm. Now that incident came as the city of Winnipeg prepares to fill a new position to oversee all security measures at the campus on Main Street. Councillor Marcus Chambers says the Edmonton incident shows the need for metal detectors similar to those at other city facilities, including the Millennium Library and other government buildings such as the Manitoba Legislature. Quote, I think we should have the same system where people are screened for edge weapons or guns, Chambers told reporters. Ian. The horrific incident that took place in Edmonton last month is a wake-up call for a lot of municipalities across Canada to ensure we don't see a rise in abuse and hate-motivated attacks. Could we see more municipalities following suit in the direction that Councillor Chamber wants to lead in Winnipeg? I certainly think we could. I don't, I'm not sure it's it's the right way to go all the time, but I don't see security measures being loosened. Even if you look at things like, I mean, at the macro 9-11, we're still going through significantly greater security post 9-11, even now, 22, 23 years later than we had at that time. Municipal buildings seem to be now mirroring what's happening as the councillor referenced in legislatures, in House of Commons, and other some other sensitive political places or sensitive public places as well. So it would not really be a surprise to me. It would be a sad surprise. It, it would be sad, but it wouldn't be a surprise. How do you balance the openness of local governments? Because it is traditionally called the closest to the people right. with the desire for safety in 2024. Because this incident, and I'll be honest, I watched it as it was unfolding. And it was a wake up call that a lot of municipalities, you can just walk into the front uh, open office and your administration staff is just sitting there and there's yep. no barrier between you and the residents. Sure. And a place like Edmonton with approximately a million people or Winnipeg with slightly less than that, of course, they have the the people, the sophistication, the resources to be able to implement that type of security. But if you look at 95 or 98 percent of the local governments in this country, which represent populations of two people to 20 to 20,000 people, they probably don't have those resources. And it's just, I suspect, it, it, on a per capita basis, it's just as likely that somebody is going to take exception to something that's happening in a small town in Ontario versus a big city of Winnipeg. So those that can set up some sort of security measures may certainly be considering it. Those that can't kind of have to try and work at it from the other end around the cultural change that's needed to make sure that this type of activity is not contemplated, not carried out, is not culturally accessible, all of those sorts of things, which are long term and systemic changes, which don't uh, which which address more than just the symptoms which a metal detector will catch. Now, how do how does the council be proactive on an issue like this? Because you always hope that things are never going to get this far. And I'm not trying to put blame right. on what's going on in Edmonton with the political culture that we currently live in here in Alberta. But how do you ensure that things don't get this far? You talk about the culture. Can you expand a little bit about that? Because I think this is a fascinating part of the story that municipalities need to look into. Yeah, I think it, because of the nature of hyper-partisanship that we're seeing more and more about right now, 
it is enabling people. It is emboldening people. We're seeing that groups speak among other and ramp each other up. So in order to change that, of course, you need to let the pressure off. And I don't think we can start with the public saying, hey, you guys need to behave better. I think we actually need to start with our elected officials and say, hey, you guys need to start behaving better. Because this is, I think that this permission, this tacit permission is provided through some of the, like the non-mainstream media, some of our MPs, our, our MLAs, our MNAs, MPP, all of those sorts of folks who are, if not fomenting this sort of activity, then at least turning a blind eye to it. And so they can say, it wasn't me who did it. But people behaving badly, public officials behaving badly on camera or in public events, I think gives more and more permission for this to happen. So in order to stop it, those people have to smarten up and stop doing what they're doing, realizing that this hyper-partisan nature of the world we're, we're in at the moment, at least the Western world, really is not getting us to, to a good place. In the meantime, of course, these short-term uh, short -term symptom catchers are something that we're, we're looking more and more at. I want to turn to our second story now. The January 29th Oakville Town Council meeting saw a set of dramatic and unexpected events. Dozens of upset delegates were shocked when a discussion item declared out of order from the agenda turned into a nearly four-hour delay in the council chambers and the annihilation of almost all of the evening's planned events. The source of the conflict was one of the item's evening agendas whose removal caught everyone's attention. That item was discussion item 10.1 regarding a statement from the town council in regards to the current war between Israel and Gaza. Several councillors confirmed that they had received a combined hundreds of emails from across Canada on the motion put forward by Ward 7 councillor and seconded by Ward 4 councillor. The motion was to have council endorse a commitment to community and global peace, calling for the town of Oakville Council to continue to advocate for a lasting peace solution, a call for an immediate human humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza and release of all hostages. When Oakville Mayor Rob Burton announced that item 10.1, considering the motion, would be removed from the evening's agenda and the 24 scheduled delegate presentations would not be heard, what originally anticipated to be an ordinary meeting quickly changed to the most tense gathering in recent memory of Oakville Council, according to Oakville News. Many residents addressed their frustrations with councillors' response. Ian. The ongoing war in the Middle East has been playing out in municipality after municipality, with municipalities like Yellowknife even rejecting a request to write to the federal government in support of a full ceasefire in Gaza, but has asked the new Northwest Territory Premier to do so. Now, you and I both know, Ian, foreign affairs is not an issue in the municipal <laughs> jurisdiction, but residents are, though, asking municipalities to speak up on matters of global affairs. How should municipal elected leaders move forward on issues of such sensitive nature? Yeah, I think I, I chuckled a little bit when you said that uh, foreign affairs are not uh, local in nature. All politics is local. Uh, but the point, I think your point is absolutely correct. Okay, According to the Canadian Constitution, there's no role for municipalities in international affairs or international relations. So it really puts the municipality in a tough spot when they agree to hear this type of a a position when they when one of the members puts forward a motion that's not ruled out of order at the time, even after a bit of debate, then you get this sort of uh, this sort of activity happening. This is a very polarizing issue at the moment. Of course, there are very passionate people on both sides. You mentioned that both uh, that members of council have been getting hundreds of emails from across the country. My suspicion is they probably got emails on. The pro Gaza, the, sorry, yeah, the pro Gaza and pro Israel sides, and my suspicion is that people who wrote those wrote to many municipalities, and most of them have not managed to get themselves in the middle of this international international affair, whereas this particular municipality, of course, has managed to do that, and it's very difficult to extract themselves from it. Uh, the role of local government, of, for instance, here. I'm old enough to remember when uh, municipal councils declared themselves nuclear-free zones, probably in the 1980s or 1990s. Uh, it wasn't quite as polarizing as this, but I do remember some of the debate around that. And there is a long-term effect to this on two sides. One is, does it expand the trouble that municipalities cause themselves without expanding their ability to have any impact? 
And does it make people even more cynical that their local government isn't listening to them because they're not taking action as these 20 some odd delegations thought they were going to do? Maybe a case of role clarity and not understanding what local government does entirely. It may have just been somebody gave them an inch and they took a mile. Who knows? But ultimately, of course, this isn't a place that local governments ought to be finding themselves in because there's nothing they can do about it. Now, the reason I wanted to talk about this story, and I'm going to sort of throw a curveball, not talking about foreign affairs for a second, but talking about the the government sort of response. Um, to put a motion like this even in the agenda to begin with is one thing, but then to take it out of the agenda at the council meeting is another yeah. How should municipalities, knowing that you're going to get potentially some people wanting to speak about this, how should municipal leaders uh, navigate the uh, complexities of putting something on an agenda and then afterwards at the meeting saying, okay, it's out of order now, so we're going to take it out? First thing, first of all, my take is that nothing should, nothing that is not within the realm of local government impact should probably be on an agenda in the first place. And usually agendas are set a week or more in advance of the meeting, often uh, through a consultation with the mayor or Reeve or warden and the CAO, or maybe this, the clerk and those sorts of people who should be catching things like this. However, uh, individual members of council certainly have the right to put things on the agenda that they see fit. There's a way to do that through their procedure bylaws. Uh, a couple of members of council here, it sounds like took advantage of that, but I still think it should probably have gone through the filter of the, um, the agenda approving process and either not have showed up on the agenda or showed up as a correspondence or a for information rather than asking to hear from people. We're just going to turn to our last story now because uh, we have, this is another one that I wanted to chat about a little bit about sort of the dynamics of council. The town of Renfrew, Ontario, Mayor Tom Sidney is vowing to stay in the job after the town council voted in favor of a motion of non-confidence against him. Councillors passed the motion in a 4-3 vote late in January after they expressed concerns over the mayor's handling of an expansion to the Renfrew Mataway Activity Centre, now known as the MyFM Centre. The project saw the addition of a second ice pad, a walking track, gymnasium, fitness center, and multicultural hub that was originally budgeted for $18 million, but has so far cost upwards to $35 million and is far behind schedule. Councillor John McDonald brought forward the motion of non-confidence, saying, quote, This is a multi-million dollar total financial failure of the Matu Way project. There was a total disregard for the proper stewardship of taxpayer dollars, end quote. Ian, the mayor in question is saying that he has no plans to go anywhere and will serve out the remainder of his term. When councils have a public conflict, how can a municipality function when a council is divided over the issue of confidence in their mayor? But before you answer that, I do want to just say this. I, I had the pleasure to meet uh, Tom. I've chatted with Tom in person. I, I got to know Tom. He's been on my show. So I just want to put any conflict of interest out on the open. So I know of Tom. I've met with the, some members of the Renfrew Council. I just want to get your opinion on how this dynamic sort of moves forward with it being so early into 2024 and even early into their term. It is very early in the term, of course, that uh, I believe the elections were late last 2022. fall. 2022. Yeah. 2022 or 2023. Anyway, 2022. still relatively early in the term and I don't know Mayor Sydney, so everything that I, uh, from this case, I've kind of read about. Um, this one is, I mean, first of all, a vote of non-confidence in a mayor really doesn't do anything. If the mayor was appointed from within council, conceivably that role could be taken away from the person, but that's not the case here. Where the mayor is elected at large, the only people who can remove the mayor are either the voters in the next election or uh, the provincial order of government or the presumably the courts could do it as well. So this case, a vote of non-confidence really has no standing other than something that might be symbolic or uh a desire to get something on the record. There is no uh, there's no effective council in this country that doesn't have disagreements with one another, where the mayor falls in and out of favor with one or more members of council, and the opposite is also true, going the other direction. What's happened here, of course, is that people have put their, their cards on the table. The elected members have put their cards on the table and voted. My guess is that the mayor voted as part of this, because it's an odd number of votes. And it becomes uh, the will of council. 
the past, of course. But if the will of council is something that council really can't do anything about, it becomes a little bit performative. And I don't know really what the benefit in doing something like this is. There's no recall legislation in Ontario, unlike there is in other, other parts of the country. So even uh, an annoyed citizens group couldn't do any more than what the uh, what the, the other members of council who have chosen to, to take this vote of non-confidence have. I will say too, that in this particular case, uh, often, well, and maybe even broader than this, people who are watching local government or who live under the influence of a local government get frustrated. I get it for whatever reason, if it's short-term frustration or some major decision they've made that has a long-term impact. They just sometimes don't understand the, the, the role of local government, the procedure that run the local government, or in some cases they do understand that and they're annoyed enough that they just want somebody to not enforce the rules because of something to do with common sense or something like that. Before I let you, uh, before we turn to our interview, uh, I just have one last question on this because I, I looked at this story as an outsider's perspective. If I was a business, if I was a sort of an inv investor wanting to invest in my money into Renfrew, would I be deterred or would there be recourse where people say, what's going on in council is going to stop me and maybe I'll go down five kilometers down the road and invest mm -hmm. in my build a, a business or build a development down the road because their council seems to have it together. Well, I imagine the people in tourism and economic development, which is an interesting segue to our interview, I imagine those people would not have been particularly thrilled with what's happening here within the uh, within the, within council. Of course, it's not going to do any good. Even if it doesn't harm, it's not going to do any good. But you're right. A lack of stability in a local government could certainly dissuade somebody who is a bit on the fence about whether to invest or relocate to a particular municipality when they could go 5, 10, 15 minutes down the road and do something there. I mean, there are other factors at play too, right? Proximity to uh, to workers, the cost of doing businesses, red tape, which is always coming up too. But yeah, it's going to have an impact for sure. Speaking of tourism, we'll be right back with our tourism specialist for Tourism Oxford, Meredith Maywood. Welcome to W is for Welcome to Our Community on the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. Our guest today is Meredith Maywood, Tourism Specialist at Tourism Oxford. Meredith was recognized as the 2022 Ontario Tourism Champion of the Year for her, her exceptional work, which included supporting her local businesses to recover from the severe economic challenges posed by COVID-19. Under her leadership, the county has also gold level certification with Sustainable Tourism 2030 and has received a provincial award for sustainable tourism. So with that, welcome to the Political Trenches, Meredith. Great to meet you both. Thank you for having me here. So I want to kick off by talking about municipal tourism a little bit and particularly the rise in digital marketing. Uh, from your perspective with uh, Tourism Oxford and Oxford County, how can municipalities leverage online platforms and social media to reach a broader audience and attract tourism from both local communities and international markets? Yes, and it, it is a constantly shifting environment uh, when it comes to digital. So basically, uh, when you're looking at that, uh, costs are going up. Uh, there are constant changes in how the software works and how people are engaging with it. So it's really important to be adaptive and very flexible with your tactics. Uh, the first thing though really is what is your product and are you reaching your audience? So, you know, you've got to have the right photos, uh, the right text, things that will speak and resonate with the people you want to come and they will find you but you still have to get out there, try adapting and using some of the new features and be efficient with your time. So for instance, if you have a newsletter, are you pushing that out through your social media channels as well? If you're doing reels, are you also using Miss Shorts on YouTube? Uh, and the huge gem is you've got to have partnerships, uh, especially if you're talking about reaching a further audience. So for example, we're in market right now, but we're in market in partnership with our regional tourism organization, Ontario Southwest and Destination Ontario. So we're reaching, reaching a way larger audience than we could have on our own. Hmm. So when it comes to your specific area, though, in Oxford County, how do you decide what's unique about you? Because presumably you're trying to differentiate yourself from somewhere else to bring people in, whether it's digitally or physically. Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, and I think 
that's why the conversation really has to start with what's your unique story? What makes us Oxford County? Because when you're talking about that, you're not competing with anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, you're distinct to your area. So for us, uh, from a unique selling proposition, obviously, um, we're very easy to get to. Uh, we're located on Highway 401 and 403. We're two hours from three border crossings, 90 minutes from downtown Toronto. So that's the proximity component. Then when you get here, for a lot of areas, there's a long drive between stops. We don't have that. You're about 10, 15 minutes to the next thing down the road. And then when it comes to product, uh, we're really celebrating our place and our people and what we bring to the table. We're calling that our DNA. So how the land, uh, man-made and natural, um, inspires us to do what we do. So whether that is someone who's worked in a factory and in the creative economy and is a bit of an engineer and then takes on doing something new. Uh, like offering up crokinole boards and selling them internationally. Uh, or uh, we're the dairy capital of Canada, producing over a billion glasses of milk a year. So we have a cheese trail here uh, and we've got the cheese to provide it as well. So yeah, just really picking what makes your community unique and celebrating it. Have you seen a rebound since COVID-19 uh, for from a tourism perspective? And what are you looking at in sort of the metrics to ensure that the tourism is, industry is as, as successful or more successful than it was prior to the pandemic? Yeah, and I will say that is a complicated question with a complicated answer. I love, com <laughs> we love complicated answers on this show. <laughs> I could chat with you all day. <laughs> uh, so basically, um, you know, some sectors uh, obviously had challenges and COVID had impact on the community. Um, so basically, you know, like the value of real estate here shot through the roof. So some people accelerated their retirement plans and closed their business during that time, uh, you know, and then consumer habits changed, but in a positive and a negative way. So during COVID, our farm producers had a really good year, um, for the most part, you know, depending on what the, you know, if they didn't have issues with capacity, um, you know, for people just coming out and shopping the farms, they were very busy. Uh, but then, of course, you know, other sectors, it was incredibly difficult. Um, so that kind of like for answering how it went during that time. Um, since then, we're seeing growth. And I will not say that all growth has come because of tourism. But we're seeing with that growth is they're investing in tourism. So they're seeing the potential here. And that's really exciting. So for instance, in the last three years, three cheesemakers opened up. Uh, we have two Nordic spas in Oxford County now. I have a new hotel being built currently. And I'm expecting more hotel renovations in the future. Um, and when it comes to monitoring and making sure we have that growth, we really work closely with our regional tourism organization, Ontario Southwest, and we do data analysis. So we're looking at, you know, how many people are coming to the area and staying overnight. We're looking at who is interested in coming to the area and monitoring our marketing as well as our visitor inquiries. So we are keeping track of that. And then we're also always constantly looking at what's next, who's the next market we could be reaching out to. Hmm. You, a lot of what you have talked about seems to be kind of long term inherent to the county and the region. You mentioned Southwest Ontario. What about uh, event attraction? We we know some places are the home of sports tournaments or games of some sort. Do you do those big splash short duration events as well to attract a different type of visitor? Uh, so in Oxford County, um, we don't have a convention center at this time. Um, but we will be getting one in the future. Uh, so for events, we do have sports tourism happening. We keep in touch with the municipalities about what the capacity is at the arenas, but that's really an uh, entity that isn't at that level that you're thinking of in some of the larger municipalities that actually have a division for that. Um, we actually have a team of three for Oxford County <laughs> in tourism. Um, but we do have one major event here, which has a huge impact on our community, and they have their own permanent property, uh, and that's the Discovery Farm where Canada's Outdoor Farm Show is held, and that is a huge benefit to our community, and we're there at the International Tent every year, uh, welcoming international visitors and media. Me. You've mentioned uh, early on about the, how you, as a person or as a, as a role, fit within the county structure. 
obviously the CAO, and then there's council above that. Do you, how do you, how supportive are elected officials or how do you engage elected officials in either supporting what you've currently got or supporting initiatives that you're thinking about in the future? Yes, so we submit a business plan every year uh, to the county as part of the budget process, right. and that gets reviewed and approved by council, as well as sending in uh, reports to council on a regular basis for projects that we are doing uh, to give them an update. We usually do that at least once a year. I have another report going in a couple of weeks with our annual review of 2023. Uh, and then of course we have our industry newsletter, which counselors are receiving and they get regular updates through that as well. And they can come out to our events and do. What is the best practices to attract domestic tourism, the people who are in your own backyard. Because when I speak to municipal leaders from across Canada, it's they always chuckle whenever I say people would rather in Canada go off to X, Y, or Z country because it's nice and warm and we're a nice cold spot, especially as we're recording this, uh, even though Wyerton Willie said six less weeks of winter. How do we promote ourselves domestically, locally, to bring Canadians to our backyard? Because we all have great stories to tell municipally across this country. And trust me, I've spoken to enough of the councillors from Oxford County to know that I'm looking forward to visiting. But what are the best practices that you do as Tourism Oxford to promote, attract local residents to your community to keep their economic dollars here? Yes, so our main focus actually has been domestic tourism. So I'm happy to talk about that. <laughs> uh, we are just getting more and more traction on the international front right now. Uh, so for domestic tourism, it's really what type of travel are they looking for? Uh, coming to Oxford, they're probably not looking to come for five days, uh, but they're probably looking to come for two to three days for a little mini escape. Uh, so it's knowing what product you're offering. So for example, right now is the perfect time for kind of a couple's relaxation escape to Oxford. It's winter, but you're not dealing with a ton of snow. Um, if you're not into the ski hill, it's a great place. If you want food and relaxation, hit a Nordic spa, take in a theater performance, visit our art galleries, uh, and have some great food and explore the cheese trail along the way. Cheese isn't seasonal. It's not something that comes out of the ground. <laughs> so with that in mind, is there best practices that or advice that you would give to other uh, destination marketing organizations like Tourism Oxford to across Ontario and even across Canada that you would say, you know what, the best way forward in 2024 is X or the best way to attract those domestic uh, tourists that we have sort of successfully done, you would be best to do this. What, what advice would you give other DMOs? So really for every region, the answer is going to be different on what the product is, but it's really looking at what your strengths are and then moving forward with those, but really looking at development to fill the gaps or the opportunities that you see. So for instance, like looking at what Destination Canada is doing right now and what they're really interested in seeing development is, uh, is in rural tourism and shoulder season. Um, so how can you tap into some of those things that are happening at a national level, um, but are also happening for us on a regional and provincial level? See where you can align yourself with the things that are going on. Um, we've always looked for alignment. When we developed our cycling, um, when we developed our first original strategy for the area, um, I was looking for alignment with what the province and what the region were doing hmm. and where it fit well for our community. Who comes up with the ideas for how do you, we talked about, started off talking about what makes Oxford County unique. I mean, this is, is it you and your staff? Is it a chamber of commerce? Is it the businesses themselves are just looking to grow themselves? How do you come up with these concepts and ideas and eventually decide what to roll out? We uh, have really worked closely with our businesses uh, and we really strive to have a strong relationship with them. So it's understanding what they're interested in, where's, where can we align with that and support them, and where we can work together. So we've done a lot to bring businesses to work together. Um, so that's kind of how we've accomplished what we have and come up with the ideas. We've also worked with consultants. So when we were starting the Cheese Trail, uh, we worked with the Culinary Tourism Alliance. And they helped us develop the model and bring the partners together 
to develop the cheese trail. When it came to developing our cycling routes, we worked with Ontario by bike uh, and they helped us develop cycling routes throughout the uh, county. So we do bring in the experts as well. And I think that's so valuable to get that information and to learn from them having them at the table. So you uh, just, my last question perhaps for you is, just to build on that a little bit, uh, you said earlier on too that you see yourselves as a region attracting visitors. So you don't necessarily compete with nearby municipalities, but do you see yourselves in competition with elsewhere in Canada or even elsewhere in Ontario uh, as a region to bring in people? I, the only kind of competition I have myself personally is being internally competitive. <laughs> so am I bringing forward the best product that I can in my work? Um, but, uh, so I see us all growing together. Like we learn from each other. You know, I was on a national call probably what last month and, uh, we're sharing ideas on that call. Um, you know, I am right, bes I'm a half hour to 45 minutes from Lake Erie, uh, in wineries. I'm not a wine region. We're known for hops, which gotta love a good okay. IPA. But uh, I benefit from our neighbors and they benefit from us. Um, you know, we had a group come through of um, a couple, they were touring Ontario. We all got a chance for them to come and explore the area. And I was giving recommendations for the next place they were going. Thanks. So uh, I have one last question before I do my last sort of wrap up question. And I want to talk about trends. What trends are you looking at in 2024? I know we are literally a month and two days into the 2024, but I'm assuming you were looking, and I shouldn't assume, but I, I, I would assume that you were looking at what is coming up in the future of tourism. While more and more people are looking for that individual experience, what are you looking for in the tourism trends in Oxford County and or even in the tourism sector as a whole when it comes to municipal tourism? Uh, so when looking at trends, like obviously I'm looking at what the consumers are interested in and we monitor that on a regular basis. Um, so from that perspective, like obviously uh, outdoors, shoulder season, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, making sure everybody feels welcome when they come here and that we're moving forward in a sustainable way for our community are some of the key areas that I'm really watching and trying to learn in. Uh, and then when it comes to locally, where are some of those new opportunities? Like you have to keep your, um, you need to keep an eye on the heartbeat of the community and what are some of the new opportunities and people that might not have been ready to come to the table a year ago, but are now and how can we work with them? Meredith, uh, I want to thank you from both Ian and myself for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down with us and talk about tourism in the municipal sector. Uh, it seems like uh, Oxford County is well served with you in Tourism Oxford. So thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Chris and Ian. It was so much fun. Thanks, Meredith. Our Have full interview day. with Meredith will be airing next Wednesday. Until then, we'll be right back after this quick commercial. Ian, W is for Welcome to Our Community. Another great episode under your belt. How do you think it went? Have we had a more welcoming guest than Meredith before? I don't know that we have. So she seems to be in completely the right spot. So it was a neat little juxtaposition to get to how things are going well from the initial stories that we had off the top. So it was a, it was a good way to end for sure. And it seems like Tourism Oxford is well served with her there as the tourism specialist. Um, before I let you go, what's what's coming up for strategic steps and what's coming up for yourself over the next two weeks? Well, strategic steps continues to hum along, roll along. We're actually it's it's picking up again in January now. It's well, it was never really slowed down. I'm back here for a little while. I am finding a whole lot of people who are interested in being interviewed for my book on abuse uh, in the municipal realm. And that's both gratifying and troubling at the same time. So I'll be working on that. I'm about, I've written about 10,000 words. So we're about 20% of the way through the book. So I, before I let you go, I have to ask, how can people sort of uh, get get to know about this project? Because if they have a story to tell that yeah. they're willing to tell on the record or even uh, anonymously, how can they reach out to you? Right. Well, maybe we'll stick in the show notes, just my email address, which is just ian at strategicsteps.ca. You can also find me just by my name on LinkedIn as well. And that's what a lot of people have been doing over the last little while. 
With that, uh, Ian, another great episode under our belt. We'll be back in two weeks' time for X, and I can't believe we're three away from completing a trifecta of 26 episodes. It's Until exciting. Next time, exciting, exactly. Always a pleasure to sit down and chat to you about the municipal realms on the Political Trenches Local Government Network, Ian. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris.